Okay, so good afternoon in Europe. Good morning, still here in the US. Um, I wanted to talk about this piece of work that, we, that is mainly the work of a grad student in Uruguay, Florencia Benitez. She's just graduating uh, in a couple of weeks. Her advisor is my collaborator of many years, Rodolfo Gambini, and Luis Lenner and Steve Liebling were also involved. Um, this subject of universality and scaling uh, um, was very popular in the mid-1990s. Um, so I wondered if particularly young people in the audience perhaps are not very familiar with all this. So I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction um, because actually the results we have on this can be described relatively quickly. Um, so the story here is that in 1993, Matt Choptrick solved the Einstein equations with spherical symmetry coupled to a massless scalar field. Um, his paper has close to a thousand citations which might be surprising because uh, this system, of course, does not happen in nature, right? We do not have macroscopic classical massless scalar fields that collapse and form black holes. The interest in this was because the dynamics of the system is really fascinating. Um, the idea is one is in spherical symmetry. So I'm going to use my hands in this part of the talk a little bit. You have to look at the camera more than the slides. Um, so you're in spherical symmetry, so your initial data has to be spherically symmetric. So for instance, you could take like a shell of, of scalar field with some profile, okay, on the shell, it could be like a Gaussian profile, and you let it go in, for instance. And if the amplitude is not very large, the shell is gonna come in, hit the origin, and then disperse to infinity, pretty much like it would do in, in flat space-time. Scalar fields cannot stay still, they move at the speed of light. However, if you crank the amplitude of the field quite a bit, the field comes in and it forms a black hole. It keeps on moving at the speed of light, but behind a horizon, and it cannot escape. So the question was lingering before this piece of work of, suppose you now crank down the amplitude a little bit, you'll still form a black hole, but you'll form a smaller one, less mass. Suppose you keep on crank down and cranking down the mass, you'll form smaller and smaller and smaller black holes. And the question was, is there going to be a limit to this? There's going to be at some point where you just stop forming a black hole at a finite mass, or will you be able to form black holes arbitrarily small? Um, there was a bit of a discussion of this beforehand because some people said, well, you know, this is classical general relativity. Uh, the only constants you have are G and C. You can't form a mass out of that. So there's no characteristic mass scale that would suggest that there ought to be a minimum mass. But other people said, well, but you know, the system is nonlinear. There could be something like a, a, some sort of soliton or things that form. And this is what Matt decided to probe numerically. So he considered families of initial data of the type I was suggesting. The scalar field is a Gaussian centered at some radius, some width, some amplitude. And he set up the time derivative such that the pulse is ingoing. This is not very important if you don't do it. Typically, the pulse sort of separates in two and a part goes out and a part goes in. So he evolved this numerically. And what he noted was that, um, say you keep fixed, for instance, the width and the initial position of the Gaussian and you play with the amplitude of the field. As you start very small amplitudes, you don't form a black hole. But as you crank up, crank up, eventually you reach a P star, a critical value of the parameter in which you start forming a black hole. And from there on, the mass of the black hole you form follows a power law of this sort. So essentially, he, to the extent that numerically you can prove anything, proved that there was no mass gap, that you could form black holes arbitrarily small. Now, if this had only been the result, this would have been, okay, fine, but you know, we could have probably conjectured that it was gonna be something like this. Um, but what came as a big surprise was that uh, he noted that this power law that you get and this exponential are universal. That is, no matter what you put as initial data, you always get a law of this sort. The parameters vary, the constant of proportionality varies, but this exponent is universal. So for instance, we could have kept the amplitude fixed and we could have played with the width of the Gaussian, or we could have kept the amplitude and the width fixed and we could have played with the initial position of the Gaussian and you would have always gotten a law of this sort. This is a picture from Choptrick's paper where he compares three different families of the initial data. And it's, this is a log-log version of this plot. So it would be a straight line 
with this point being at minus infinity, minus infinity down there. Um, the surprises kept on coming uh, because um, Choptrick had a rather sophisticated code, at least at the time. It was a code that had adaptive mesh refinement. So the code could put more points in the net, in the, met, in the, in the numerical grid, wherever it needed it, and it could sort of lower the step size accordingly to populate certain regions of space time with a lot of points as needed. At the time, this was extremely cutting edge. It was the first time that it was done in relativity. The algorithm that he implemented due to Berger and Oliver had only been around for a few years. Um, and he decided to probe what was happening in the region close to criticality. And he found something interesting, the fact that, you know, suppose you, are, you come to criticality from subcritical, um, so you're barely not forming a black hole. What you notice is the field, scalar field seemed to like hesitate. It came in, again, I'm using my hands again. It came in and sort of oscillated for a couple of times and then it dispersed. And he conjectured that if you were able to sort of nail the critical value, the oscillations would go on forever. In fact, what I did with my hands is a little bit misleading because the oscillation is not in TR really. It's not periodic in TR, but it's periodic in log T, log R. So like the idea is you, you come in, your first oscillation will be like that, and your second one will be really tiny. That's why he really could exploit his adaptive mesh refinement. And even with that, he can only see like a couple of the oscillations because of course it's very difficult to beat a log numerically. So Z is any of the scalar variables in the problem. And what he's seeing is that in log coordinates, the function exhibits periodicity. This is what is known as discrete cell seminality. And this period that he found was also universal. Here is another plot from Chopwick's paper where he takes one of these functions of a scalar field, I believe this is a spatial derivative, and he plots it uh, at two different instances of space and time superposed and as you see it's the same curve so there was a lot of, of speculation at the time about you know what is going on here i mean this looks like critical phenomena there seems to be universality there is a scaling law but at the same time you know this is uh, sort of classical field theory it's not statistical mechanics so it's really very different from traditional um, uh, phase transition say in condensed matter physics so uh, a picture that emerged uh, in several people was something like this. And this is a sort of hand drawn, as you see, because this is just a sketch. This is pretending to be the phase space of a theory, which of course being a field theory is really infinite dimensional. So you can't draw it, okay? So, so this is just like an artist's conception of what is going on. So that what people were conjecturing was that there was some sort of critical solution that would correspond to nailing this point here, the one that had infinite amount of oscillations, that would go round and round and round forever, so to speak, in phase space. And that when you sort of were subcritical, you would sort of come, sort of latch onto that critical solution for a couple of oscillations and then disperse. Or if you were supercritical, so if you were slightly on the black hole side of things, your solution would sort of latch onto criticality for a little while and form a black hole. And obviously, you can form a black hole without being critical at all. But this was, you know, conjectured. Uh, but then Karsten Gunlach came out and decided to take seriously the period periodicity in log T log R. And he formulated the Einstein equations as a boundary value problem. So he demanded that in log T log R, you have a sort of a square of periodic boundary conditions and he kept the period free. So this is a, 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 a boundary eigenvalue problem, where this is your eigenvalue. And he uh, was able to solve this using a relaxation scheme and find the eigenvalue to be this 3.44 that was the period that Choptrick had found in log T log R. He then went on to do something further. He perturbed this solution, it's numerically found, but it's you can still perturb it. I mean, the, the, the Einstein equations here are not that complicated. There's really three of them. And so the perturbation equations are linear equations with the coefficients you had to read off from the solution that he had numerically. And he found that the perturbations deviate exponentially with a Lyapunov exponent equal to the 0.374, which was the, the exponent Choptrick found. So this sort of completed the picture. People found uh, similar behavior in other systems. 
Abrahams and Evans, um, um, uh, uh, studied imploding gravitational waves. This is complicated to do because gravitational waves, of course, cannot be spherically symmetric. So they had to go to axisymmetry, which was really cutting edge at that time. Uh, remarkably, in this case, the period of the oscillation is a little bit bigger. So in, without using adaptive mesh refinement, they were able to see at least one oscillation. And so technically, this is actually something that could happen in reality. If you form the black hole collapsing gravitational waves, you could see this scaling. Coleman's and Evans also um, found similar behavior in the collapse of incoherent radiation. Again, something that also could happen in reality. And Stroming and Thorlesius um, uh, found similar behavior in models of string theory. And I'll leave it up to you if this is reality or not. Um, then the floodgates sort of opened. This is from Kirsten's Living Reviews paper. People studied all sorts of, of different fields here um, on the left. And they did collapse simulations like Matt Choptrick had done. They found the critical solution and perturbations like Karsten had. This even inched its way into another realm of reality. Um, people studied um, what would this imply for the mass function of primordial black holes. After all, primordial black holes are presumably very small. And so if you look at the tail end of very small black holes being, being created, this phenomenon could leave an imprint there. And here are a couple of papers in, in the astrophysics literature looking into this. OK, this sort of concludes my introduction. Um, so what did we do? So we wanted to do a quantum version of this. But unfortunately, no one knows how to build a quantum theory for the system. We had made some progress with loop quantum gravity in spherical symmetry in vacuum. Um, the way we did that is we noted that you could recombine the constraints. So the constraint algebra is a Lie algebra, so it doesn't have structure functions, and that allows to complete the direct quantization. Unfortunately, we do not know how to do this when matter is present. So when the matter is present, you have the, the traditional problem of quantum gravity, even in four dimensions, although you're in spherical symmetry, that you have structure functions, and therefore you don't know how to represent that through a direct quantization. So faced with this, we settled by trying to do a sort of poor person's version of the semi-classical analysis. We cannot do a semi-classical analysis either because to do a semi-classical analysis, first you need a, a quantum theory in which you study semi-classical states. And as we said here, we do not know how to build a quantum theory. So we were really obstructed in that sense. That's why we did what we call a poor person's version of semi-classical analysis. What is this? Well, it has been observed in several models, particularly in, in loop quantum cosmology, that if you polymerize some of the variables of the classical equations, you obtain the semi-classical equation. So these are models where you can actually build a, a quantum theory and study a property of semi-classical limit. And it was found that a sort of cheap way of getting that semi-classical li limit without building the quantum theory is to perform this thing called a polymerization, in which you take some of the variables of the theory and replace them by what is known as their polymer version with k called the polymerization parameter. What is the rationale for this? Well, remember in loop quantum gravity, one works on a Hilbert space where the connection itself is not a well-defined operator, but it's exponential, the holonomy is. So, the idea would be that this is not a well-defined operator in your quantum theory, but it's holonomy, quote unquote, the exponential, it's a sign because it has to be real, of course, is. So the idea is X would be a not well-defined operator, but it's holonomy, quote unquote, is. Um, this had actually been tried for this system in traditional metric variables of general relativity, by two groups in Canada, Ziprick and Constater, and Vikar Hussein. Now, there is not a terribly good sort of motivation to do this. The metric variables of general relativity, of course, are not a connection. There isn't a Hilbert space in which they wouldn't be defined and their holonomies would be. In fact, there wouldn't be a holonomy defined for them. But they said, you know, let's try it and see what it gives. I mean, after all, uh, and this is something I want to emphasize, and I'll come back at the end of the talk, when one is doing these kind of calculations, one is not thinking that this is really going to be how reality operates. One is more or less trying to probe what is possible uh, in terms of options rather than try to land 
directly initially on what would be the right solution. So I, I, I certainly don't criticize them for trying this. Um, uh, the problem is that when they work in metric variables, spherical symmetry, things are so gauge fixed that at the end of the day, what they ended up doing is polymerizing the one over R factor that appears in the equation where R is the radius of the spheres of symmetry. This is the polymerization they proposed and this is the polymerization parameter. And what they found was, um, this is again, the same plot as we had before uh, without log log. What they found in this blue plot is general relativity, polymerization parameters sort of uh, going to zero. Um, this would be Choptrick's results uh, for the mass as a function of the initial parameter of the initial data. And these are different values of this polymerization parameter. And what you see is as soon as it's non-zero, there is a mass gap. There is a minimum value of the mass of the black hole that you can form. And the mass gap depends on the polymerization parameter. A lot of people looked at this and said, yeah, this sounds reasonable. I mean, uh, the quantum theory, of course, now does have a, a, a characteristic mass, the Planck mass, because you have G, C, and H bar. And so it is reasonable that it is different than the classical GR case where you do not have a characteristic mass, okay? So this was done some time ago as well, 2009, so, so to speak. So we thought, well, we're probably gonna reproduce these results when we try to do this with loop quantum gravity. So in loop quantum gravity, when you treat things in spherical symmetry, you have six variables in total. You have the radial triad, the sort of tangential triad in the feed direction. They're canonically conjugated momenta, and of course the scalar field and its canonically conjugated momentum. If you want to, the, these variables can actually be related relatively easily with the metric variables. So this is what you, how you would normally write uh, the spherically symmetric metric. This would be the radius of the spheres of symmetry. And there will be a, 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 a lapse and there will be a GRR component. And this is the relation between these traditional metric variables and these uh, Ashtikar variables in terms of the sort of um, radial and tangential triad. This is the relation of extrinsic curvature, traditional extrinsic curvature with the canonically conjugated momentum, momenta of these variables. In loop quantum gravity, you're supposed to polymerize the variables that transform as connections. So that would be the canonically conjugated momenta. And you're also supposed to polymerize the scalar field. This was discussed some time ago by Lewandowski, Thiemann and others that if you want to put scalar fields within the Hilbert space that is used in loop quantum gravity, that is diffeomorphism invariant, you need to polymerize the scalar field as well. So that was our plan. We were gonna polymerize these two variables this way and polymerize the scalar field this way. However, we were faced with a practical problem. Um, there is no way of comparing easily space times in different coordinates, particularly numerically. So if you're gonna write a code, uh, presumably we want to compare what we were getting here with what Choptrick got, uh, and therefore the, the reasonable thing to do was to choose the same coordinates that Choptrick chose, because otherwise it would have been very difficult to compare the space times. So we decided to choose the same coordinates that Choptrick did to facilitate the comparison of the results. Now, Choptrick chooses G theta theta equals R squared, and as we had in the previous slide, G theta theta is related to our ER variable. So if you choose this equal to little r squared, then this ER gets gauge fixed. But if ER gets, gets fixed, you can take the diffeomorphism constraint, which is written here, ER is gauge fixed now, it's algebraic in terms of KR. So you can use this equation to eliminate KR. Choptwick also uses another um, um, coordinate condition that is very commonly used in numerical relativity. It is a condition on the trace of the extrinsic curvature. This condition eliminates K phi. But as a consequence of this coordinate choice, of our original plan of polymerizing these three variables, these two got gauge fixed, and therefore they're not variables in the problem anymore. So the only thing you're left to polymerize is the scalar field. So actually this in practice worked to our benefit because we could go to Matt Choptrick's FTP side, download his code, 
And we could keep all the left-hand side of the Einstein equations untouched because nothing changes. Polymerization doesn't touch them and simply polymerizes scalar field. Well, simply is a simplified word. The code is quite complicated because it has the adaptive mesh refinement and it boundaries between different layers and so on. So it wasn't all that easy to polymerize the scalar field, but we did it. And we used uh, essentially job to call code with relatively minor modifications. Now, unknown to us, David Garfinkel had shown that um, the classical system has an invariance, T going to a constant times T, R going to a same constant times R, and that invariance is uh, a necessary condition to have a critical solution. Why do I bring this up? Well, because if we go back to the previous polymerization, messing around with the R variable the way they're doing here breaks that invariance. So in hindsight, it's not surprising that they don't have a critical solution, that they have a mass gap. But in our polymerization, we're not touching the R variable, we're polymerizing just the scalar field. So that preserves this T, T going to be T, R going to be R invariant. And therefore, there was a chance that it could be a critical solution. So the, the, this is what you just said before, the, the previous polymerization broke that invariance. And so we ran the code, and these are the results we get. Again, this is mass of the black hole as a function of the parameter. Um, you, you probably can't see much here, but yellow is chop to its results. This little blue, green line is polymerization parameter equals one. This is polymerization parameters equals two. Polymerization parameters equals three. And these curves continue to infinity, showing there is no mass gap. So indeed, contrary to previous polymerization results, what we have found here is that the system behaves essentially like classical GR with very minor discrepancies. K equals one, for all practical purpose, is a humongous value for the polymerization parameter because the polymerization parameter is supposed to be Planck scale and it has units of length, so it's supposed to be like a Planck length. Um, so K equals one in this context is ridiculously large. So even in that case, you're very, very close to, to the classical case to general relativity. We then turned on the adaptive mesh refinement in Chopwick's code, and we were after two goals. The first one was to explore the wiggles that appear in the exponent that were theorized and demonstrated by Hod and Peran. What Hod and Peran conjectured was that uh, the Chopwick scaling law wasn't just this, plus a constant if you want, but that there was a periodic wiggle component mounted on top of it. They offer a motivation for this that I don't know if I completely understand. That they say that essentially how many times you latch onto the critical solution depends on how separated you are from it. And that creates a sort of depend periodic dependence in the departure from the exponent depending on where you started. Irrespective of what the explanation for that is, they observed this numerically. So we decided to see if we could see it too. And so this is a little bit more detailed uh, plot of the same thing we had before, log as a function of the polymerization parameter. And you can already see there eyeballing that there's a wiggle on top of it. And what we did is we compute the, the residual between the red curve and the dots, and you indeed see the oscillations they had. This is just their result, k equals zero, general relativity. This is k equals one. As you see, the story doesn't seem to change at all. The period is the same, and is the period that they designated with this letter, that is 4.6, that Hod and Peran had found. So the wiggles are there. We don't see, maybe there is some uh, influence due to the polymerization. Within numerical errors, we can't see it here. What about the discrete self-similarity? Well, these are our, our simulations for k equals one that um, show the same curve displaced in space and in time, superposed here. And, and this is k equals one. And so we see that we observe discrete cell similarity also in the polymerized case. And we don't see any discernible difference in the behavior. This number within numerical error that we can determine uh, is the same as Joplin had observed. Um, let me finish with some future developments 
but also some limitations of these, this approach. I mean, people tend to get carried away when they see this and they start asking all sorts of questions, but you have to be rather careful with what we're doing. So I'd like to, 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 to be very clear about that. First of all, there is something here that we don't necessarily understand very well. So general relativity is a nonlinear theory, as we all know. It is a very special nonlinear theory because the, the modes of propagation all move at the speed of light, irrespective of the amplitude. This is still the case if you couple general relativity to a scalar field. Everything still moves at the speed of light, no matter what the amplitude. In a generic nonlinear theory, that is not the case. In a generic nonlinear theory, the modes, speeds depend on the amplitude. The polymerized scalar field that we're considering here is indeed such a theory. The speed of propagations of the modes become amplitude dependent, in particular for k phi close to pi over two, they vanish. Now, when this happens, it is well known in numerical relativity and in other numerical simulations that your simulations develop shocks. That is, they develop sort of sharp features that actually become sharper and sharper with time until they crash your code. Um, this is well known, and fluid dynamics, this happens all the time, um, but people know how to fix them. The way to fix them is to typically supplement, I mean, shocks don't happen in nature, so why do you have them in your numerical simulation? Well, typically it's because the equations you have are not capturing all the physics. So normally people supplement their equations with known physics, and that fixes them. For instance, in, in fluid dynamics, you add viscosity. Viscosity couples quickly to those sharp features and squashes them. But here we do not know how to fix them because we do not know what extra physics to add to make these shocks go away. Now, we have not observed any effect of them in the simulations we did up to now. Um, this is probably because these shocks tend to happen very close to criticality and perhaps we're not getting close enough, or perhaps they're affecting a region of space-time that doesn't have influence elsewhere. We haven't studied that in detail yet. Um, but there is potentially an issue there that, that, that these simulations could go bad, really where you are most interested, close to criticality. But again, I want to emphasize that one uh, should not get carried away. This is a, a poor person semi-classical analysis. So you probably shouldn't be asking questions extremely close to criticality with the theory because it there is very likely where the theory is gonna break down. When you're very close to criticality, close to the origin, you can have arbitrarily large curvatures there. In fact, presumably the critical solution has a naked singularity. And so presumably the, the, the semi-classical theory will not be very good there. Also, one has to keep in mind that these types of semi-classical analysis uh, are potentially coordinate dependent, gauge dependent, right? As you saw, because we chose this uh, um, uh, coordinate system that Chopter chose, two of our variables disappear. If you choose a different coordinate system, presumably the variables are there, you have to polymerize them, and the results will change in their details. What will not change are the robust features, uh, like the fact that we see a, a critical solution, because the polymerization of the other variables is not gonna mess up with invariance that Garfinkel had, had, had mentioned was a necessary condition to have a critical solution. It might be simply that close to criticality, one needs a full theory of quantum gravity. So let me conclude with this. Uh, we studied minimally coupled scalar fields coupled to gravity in a polymerized theory that stems from semi-classical loop quantum gravity. Again, I emphasize this is not a proper semi-classical theory. It's a fudge that in many cases gives you the semi-classical theory, but you're never guaranteed is going to work in the case you're studying. Um, it appears that universality and scaling hold like in general relativity without a mass gap and with very, very tiny difference in the scaling exponent uh, and, and none at all in the, 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 the discrete cell similarity period that we could observe. Um, there seemed to be, this is what I was saying, no, no appreciable difference in the echoing frequency, the discrete cell similarity, nor in the wiggles that Hodd and Peran found. Um, the caveat, as I keep on repeating, this is only a candidate for semi-classical theory. Work should be more viewed as what is possible and not definitive conclusions. And it might require the study of uh, the study of what happens near the, the development of negative singularities will probably require a full theory of quantum gravity. Thank you very much. So thanks very much, Jorge, for that interesting talk. So we've got 
time for quite a few questions, so please. Someone has his hand raised. Okay, couldn't see that, so uh, go ahead, please. Uh, let me check whether I can. I think Shinji was the first to raise yet. Uh, okay, I can see that. Okay, I do. So go ahead, please. I have to unmute or something. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Yes. I have a very naive question. So that it seems that there is a, a, a polymerization and a change of variable, especially say, say chemical transformation, do not commute. Is that right? Uh, then the, I, I, I say so, yeah. And then, the, so is there a first principle, guiding principle to choose, uh, uh, I mean, proper variables to polymerize or, um, or not? Yeah, so in loop quantum gravity, you polymerize the variables that are connections or, or scalar fields or, you know, electromagnetic connection and so on. Uh, because in the quantum representation of the theory, those variables are not well-defined, their holonomies are. So, so there is a canonical choice in loop quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. If you want to just play the polymerization game, like a lot of people do this, I mean, they polymerize the harmonic oscillator, for instance. There, of course, you can do whatever you want, basically. I see. Yeah, so that this is, I mean, so gravity is special. Um, well, loop quantum gravity had, comes with a whole framework uh, attached to it. It comes with an inner product, a Hilbert space, and so on. And, and, and the polymerization is tied to all that, OK? So that indicates you what you have to polymerize. Mm -hmm. I Polymerization, see. as I say, is a game you can play in any theory, and there you don't have all that framework to, to guide you. So, so there, there you're more free. Thank you. Okay. I, feel, I see three hands raised. So, Chai Yu Cheng, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. So, I have a question that uh, it looks like in your polymerization scheme, it, it is analog to the uh, so called mu zero. Uh, quantization scheme because the polymerization, con a polymerization parameter is just a constant. So is it Correct. possible to, to do this in the, in the mu bar? Uh, yeah, it should, it should be possible. It's just that, you know, when you're the first doing someone, you want to go the simplest way possible. Mu yeah. zero was what was done first because it was easier. Uh, mu bar uh, would require a little bit of motivation. Okay, so let, let me explain for everyone out there. So. It was noted in loop quantum cosmology that if you do the polymerization like I did with a constant K, um, there were certain undesirable features. And this constant K is supposed to be the minimum loop you can have in your theory. And so people noted that, well, the minimum loop in your theory is related to the quantum of area, and that is a dynamical variable. And so they invented this new polymerization scheme where the K is not a constant, that's what they call mu bar. Um, and that fixed a lot of these problems in loop quantum cosmology. Presumably, you have to do that for any model you're considering. The scalar field is a little bit more difficult to motivate because what is the minimal loop for the scalar field exactly? It's not a true holonomy. Mm -hmm. It's known as a point holonomy. But yes, that should be possible, and, and it would be interesting to see. We didn't do it just because we wanted to go the simplest possible way. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Charlie Robson, please. Uh, hi. Um, yes, I had a, <laughs> a question about uh, one of your first slides. Um, so, uh, where you uh, have a graph, I think I think it was taken from Matthew uh, Choptwick's um, work. Yes. Uh, we have a, um, have a like a mass. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so you have like a black hole mass, and then you have this um, uh, p parameter. Um, so. Um, so it looks very much to me like a like an order parameter graph and like a phase transition. Is is there any, is, is there any like um, is, is it fruitful at all to think of it that way, or, or is it just is it just just looks that way? Yeah, a lot of people pointed that out. Um, the picture that ended up emerging was uh, this one that uh, mm -hmm. Karsten Ulla consolidated. So I mean, it, it looks like an order parameter. It looks like a phase transition. But in the end, you know, this is not a statistical mechanical system. It's a classical field theory. So in what sense are you going to talk of a traditional phase transition for a system like that? I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to stick with this, this picture that, that seems reasonable and was sort of validated by Karsten. Yeah, and the, and the P parameter, which is, which is uh, the other axis other than the mass, uh, 
Uh, yeah. That was, what, what, was, what was the physical meaning of the P parameter? Uh, P parameter can be any parameter in your initial data that doesn't have a P star equals zero. If it's P star equals zero, then it's a problem. So for mm -hmm. instance, P in this case literally was the amplitude of the scalar field. But again, mm -hmm. you could have taken sigma or R zero and put them here and you were able to obtain the same result. I see, I see, uh, thank you. So thanks very much again. Um, Stefano has another question, last question, and then we move to the next speaker that is Stefano himself. So Stefano, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Jorge. Um, Hello. I have a, a question for you, which is probably based on my failing of um, understanding uh, the physical intuition of your result. I must say that uh, at first sight, I would have been uh, expecting that the polymer quantization would introduce a scale to the system and this scale would spoil uh, the universality in the scaling. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand, can you give me a kind of physical intuition why in the end this is not happening? Um, I think that um, it, it goes back to this uh, result of, um, let me see if I can bring it up, of uh, David or Finkel, that he noted that uh, if you have this type of invariance in your equations, uh, this was a, a necessary, not sufficient condition to have a critical solution. And the polymerization we're introducing is not messing this, it's not changing R or T, which is where you would expect a sort of, 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 of critical length or, or a characteristic length to alter things. The primary polymerization parameter is appearing inside of a sign in a dimensionless quantity because it multiplied times the scalar field. And therefore, it doesn't seem to manifest itself as a, as, a, as a sort of characteristic length that messes your equations. I cannot articulate it much better because probably you don't understand it much better, but that's what seems to be happening. That's interesting. So, okay. So Thank that, you. Like, I'm taking just the opportunity as a chair here to ask a question, and it's very related to Stefanos. So are you... I'm not sure whether you're suggesting, but it could be a suggestion that uh, if you are doing a quantum theory of gravity, it should better have this kind of scaling in order to match uh, sort of uh, chop to results or? No, no, I'm just observing what, what we found were the simulations. Again, I mean, I want to de-escalate this, this result. This was done with a sort of poor person's version of semi-classical theory. It could be when you turn on the full quantum theory, other things happen. Quantum gravity is really going to be important and close to criticality, so it could really spoil the classical, the, 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 the critical solution there. I don't know. Okay. So thanks very much, Jorge. Uh, Thank you. We will have more questions for sure in the discussion session. So we move to the next speaker, which is 